Yeah. There we go. Okay. Always in. <laughs> right. Hi everyone and welcome to my channel. I'm Simon of Savage Reads, and today I'm joined by my mate Kerry again, whose video you'll have seen with our Reading Horizons, but if you haven't, I'll link it down below. And she is going to have a nose, or she has had a nosy through my bookshelf. I'm going to talk about five books that I have read, and Kerry can troll me. <laughs> she can choose books that she hated but I loved, or books that she loved that I loved, or books that she wants to read. Okay, I mean, I, I should have trolled you really. I feel like I've missed an opportunity. You have, possibly. But they were high quality books, so it was quite hard, oh. actually. Yeah. That yeah. makes me feel quite pleased. Less Thanks. Barbara Cartland than I expected. So. <laughs> uh. <laughs> <laughs> you could have said anything there. I, Barbara Cartland was generous. Let's well, be all I'm going to say is, thank goodness I don't let people go through my coffee table books. Oh. 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 <laughs> so uh, the first, first book one I've got is so I kind of pick oh. books that I have a have a certain resonance with me for whatever reason, and um, that I think might be the same as yours. So the first one is Damien Barr's uh, Maggie and Me. Um, I read this when I was judging the Green Carnation Prize. Which is a prize that I founded. Uh, for LGBTQ plus writing. And um, I uh, I really enjoyed it because it's um, it's very much of sort of my childhood. Uh, it's based in North Lanarkshire where I also spent some time. Uh, he's a, a young working class queer kid. Um, it's very brave and very unflinching. Um, also though, Damien is, um, and I feel like this is kind of, more prevalent in the writing industry but still not enough such a great activist for change yeah. you know he's a real supporter of talent a real nurturer of people from underrepresented backgrounds um and i i love him for that he's well. also oh sorry that was, the toilet makes a funny noise <laughs> when it's filling up with water um, damien would appreciate that i think actually. yeah, yeah <laughs> I he'd, think he'd he be well into it um, and at some point, maybe I'll get Damien on this channel. Um, but one of the things that I also want to say is, not only is it a fantastic memoir, and it is, it is about working class. I mean, it talks about the coal mines closing. It mm -hmm. talks about the effect of the Tories. Um, and, and yeah, it, it's got all of that political stuff, but it's funny, heartbreaking. Yeah. It's just, and but what's so brilliant about Damien as well, it's, it's a Damien Bar fan club, Love Damien. is <laughs> that he's one of the kindest, nicest, most generous people. And he loves introducing people mm -hmm. who will get on and potentially help each other out. It, yeah, he's a lovely, lovely, lovely he's man. He's fabulous. Um, and this is being made into an STV uh, oh. programme. So, and also he's got a new book coming out. He has. It's which is the called... 4th of April and it's You Will Be Safe Here. It's on the shelves just over there. Okay, okay. So I need to so read that as well soon. I yeah, I'm really getting I'm very that. looking forward to it. Yeah. So this is, the, this is the first one. Okay, What's next? next? Book two. Next. Oh my God, this is so good. Ah, oh, The Mitfers, The Lair Between Six Sisters. Um, I bought this from the British Library when I was writing Tony Hogan. Really? So a really oh. long time ago. When you're writing this? Yeah, I think so, or Thirst. Anyway, I was writing one of my books, so I was going to the, the British Library and I didn't really have any money, but I picked this up and I read, I didn't really know anything about The Mitfers, it's but worth I the, It's worth the cover price, that book, because you get a lot of books. Get, for, a, lot, get yeah. a lot of heft for your, also, for your change. Also, giggles. I, oh, it's fabulous. I, oh. It's just amazing, like they're um, six very different sisters, really great and the dynamic between sisters, really great on sort of all the historical context um, and just like a really, a really good juicy read, you know? Yeah, because well, there, there's in jokes, but you begin to learn what the language, because they have their own language, some of them. Obviously, people know um, Nancy Mitford the most for her novels. Um, you might know, you might not know that one of the Mitfords, and I forgot which one it was, Jessica Mitford, um, in, uh, she did a huge book around the funerals in America and how people were being ripped off. Mm. So the cheapest uh, coffin you can get in America is called a Mitford. It's named I Jessica not Mitford. Know that. Yeah. Um, and then Unity was supposedly, possibly had an affair with Hitler. There's rumours around that. Yeah. Um, she tried to shoot herself when um, she found out that the Nazis were losing and then suddenly had some real issues after that before her death. Um, you've got Pamela, who I'm pretty sure was a lesbian. I'd be massive lesser. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 That's Pamela. Um, but what's amazing is it's the fact they got into all of these households. So not only are they an incredible dynasty and, you know, also things like Deborah and, you know, chats with House. Mm. There's just, there's so much in here. You get to meet the Queen Mother over dinner at one point and then suddenly you'll be having dinner with Hitler and then you'll be in prison with Diana because she's been doing some slightly wrong political things. It is honestly, I think that's one of the best books. So good, like a really good sort of substantial read, but like, and still quite dense, but also really enjoyable. I and love very it. gossipy. So gossipy. I know, maybe that's why you <laughs> like it. <laughs> and it's fabulous. Even if you, you're not familiar with the Mitfords, I really, really recommend it. And as Simon says, you get a lot of book for your cash. Yeah, so which is very nice. important. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that is my second. My third. Oh, she's done right, read round. Oh, this is very old, actually. 
is the raw shark texts. It's not that old. It's quite old. It's not 18th century. <laughs> it's not death day de Borier, but... <laughs> I found this tome, this dusty tome from your age. <laughs> Could just be having guys haven't cleaned in there for a while, frankly. Can we? Anyway, sorry, the so, raw shark text. The raw shark text is um, a, a sort of... Um, uh, a thriller written like in a sort of experimental style. Um, I read it when I, uh, when I was, again, when I was just starting to write and it like sort of opened me up to a whole new way of writing. Um, and I just found it like really exciting and pacey and enjoyable. Um, and it's like, um, The House of Leaves. I don't know if you've ever I've read never that. Read that. Fabulous. Really? Absolutely. I've always worried that was a bit of a gimmick, but no. lots of people love that book. Great. Really, really interesting and really intricate, like like a puzzle in a book all at oh, once, wow. but the, the substance is still there. Well, this, I think, is like a more literary version, and this is an... People are going to kill me if there's a Stephen Horne possibly never speak to me again after this. I think this is a really good literary version of The Da Vinci Code, because you have to work stuff out. Mm -hmm. You work it out and feel really clever for working it out, which the Da Vinci Code made me feel very, very clever. But there's just so much more to this. Like you've got basically a shark that is created out of words that people don't use or words, is it words that are cast aside? And let's see if I can try and find it. There's a point where the book, there we go, starts to take the form of a shark and it gets closer to you. I was terrified. <laughs> I thought I was going to bite my finger. <laughs> I get a little bit involved in books. Yeah. Which Stephen will be happy about, it will be if very not happy the about. Leonardo da Vinci connection. Yeah, sorry about that. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, anyway, it's fabulous. I just, I just, I loved it. It's I, really different. I tore through it as well. I think it's really interesting. And um, like House of Leaves introduced me to like sort of a different way of looking at language and words yeah. and how you present a story on the page, which I think yeah. is really interesting. Number three. These are great choices. Thanks. I'm uh, not going to. I don't like to say I've got favourites. I might have a favourite collection coming for these well let's see how we do the next Look two at me, actually I'm, I'm such a i'm such a schoolgirl i'm like any sort of prize <laughs> where's my gold star <laughs> don't have any sorry girl. oh well so number four is oh. uh cormac mccarthy's the road um this I... gets a caning that i don't think it deserves sometimes why does it get out of caning people think it's really like bleak and lazy I think I mean, it's, it's bleak, brilliant. but bleak's my wheelhouse, so yeah, I like, I like <laughs> that's bleak. fine. Um, I, I read this before I ever even started writing, I read this. Um, and what I remember most of all was that um, I read it in like one sitting and then I went out, I was living in like a little bed sit in London, and I went into the supermarket afterwards and I wandered around the aisles being like, so much food here, there's so much food and I'm so glad there's a bus and isn't it nice not to have cannibals chasing you with bits of woods? And trying to find tins of something. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. The tin of peaches like broke my heart in this. Um, so um, it was the it was the first book that I read where I, well not the first book that I read, but a really good example I think of how strongly you can evoke mm. a place and a setting um, and it taught me a lot about sort of um, really immersing your your reader in mm. sort of the environment they're in. I think it's extraordinary. I can still remember things from this after all yeah. the books I've read, and that was like what twelve twelve years ago or so. So, and it is, it's about a father and son basically in an apocalyptic wasteland trying to work out what. Well, they're trying to get anywhere basically, or try by people, but they know that some people are not good. What I also think is brilliant about this is depending how you read the end. I think says a lot about the person who's reading the book. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. the ending could go two ways. I've chosen for it to go probably the bleak of the two ways. <laughs> I'm an optimist. <laughs> yeah. I like bleak. No, let's It'll keep it bleak. <laughs> Carry some more bleak hope. <laughs> it's bleak, but maybe there'll be cake. That's... I'm just not bothered about redemption. <laughs> you just got the <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here first. There we go. <laughs> okay, on that cheery note, I'm going to get you a t-shirt saying I'm just not into redemption. Um, it'll fly off the shelf. Please do. Um, so the next one oh, is... Oh, great um, book. I love this book. I, can I feel like I'm surprised. These are all books that I've kept because I love them. I'm like, <laughs> that is such a great book. Great choice. Yeah. Great choice. Um, so this is A Concise uh, Chinese English Dictionary for Lovers by, um, I hope I pronounced it right, Zhao Lu Gao. I think that's right. I think it's Zhao Lu Gao. Zhao Lu Gao. And so the reason I picked this was not only because I think it is an incredible, incredible book, but again, it's a book that I read before I ever started writing myself. And I went to see her at Islington Borders, RIP. And it was quite a small, like, as an author, I've attended my own sort of one woman and a dog events. Uh, <laughs> but there was, it was kind of sparsely attended, I think, you know, it was just like one of those That said, knowing you as I do care, if you had an audience of just dogs, I don't think I'd see you oh, ever man. happier. Put a couple of my pockets and lie down on the floor. I'm not, you know... <laughs> <laughs> if we can make that happen at any time, I'll be so grateful. But um, but so it, uh, but what was really amazing was that she was so like this was kind of her 
I guess her big breakout novel, would you say? Was, was it her, no, it wasn't her debut. I think it's the third or fourth book, isn't it? Yeah. But it was her big, it was her, it was it her did first, massively. Yeah. And it was, and, um, and, but she was just so warm and sweet. She was like, I feel like we should just go to Starbucks and get a coffee and all of the chats because there's a conversation. It's not just me talking at That's you. Lovely. She was amazing. And also, it's an extraordinary book, um, a book about uh, a young woman, um, in London, in a foreign place, also experiencing like the foreignness of love and obsessive love for the first time. There's a scene um, set in a strip club, do you know what I'm talking mm -hmm. about? Which has stayed in my mind forevermore as this like fabulously like sort of dark and sexy and um, subversive sort of take on female sexuality. Mm. Um, I love it. And I think she's an extraordinary writer and also a nice human, yeah. which is nice to I know. think when those both happen at the same time, it's pretty lovely. Mm -hmm. um, I really, really want to read her memoir. Me too. I haven't I read it yet. I've got it. Yeah. Um, but I still haven't read some of I've read, I think I've read all of the books she's released since, but I haven't read the two before, um, except for her latest one, which is her memoir, which apparently is fascinating. I didn't realise she had quite the life that she's had. Mm -hmm. She's also a filmmaker. Yes. Um, and I think are. that comes across when you're reading it, because you can see, not in a way that you'd be like, this has been written to become an adaptation. But what I mean is, the way she just catches small moments. Mm. Weirdly, I always feel like when I'm reading it, I'm reading in black and white. Like I know That's I am because the page is black and white, but yeah. I visualise it in black and white. I do. Yeah. I know that, but I do find her filmic. I know exactly what you mean, which I always really like in books because mm. I'm quite visual as well. Um, and also, she does really interesting journalism on the difficulty of being from China, which is a place that heavily censors writers mm. and their narratives, and living in Britain and Berlin, and how you balance sort of those two cultural sort of contexts for your work. Um, she's fabulous. She is fabulous. She buy your book. Great choices, Kerry. Thank you. You can come again. I will. <laughs> I'll link all of those books down below. I'll also link Kerry's books down below. And we will be back in a video around the middle of May where we'll be talking about being lowborn because Kerry's new book, Lowborn, which I have wanged on about already on this channel considerably. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're going to have a conversation about that, which I hope will not only make you want to rush out and buy it because it's one of my favourite books of the year so far, but also will give you again a bit of a different insight into these two people sat in what is looking like quite a posh background. Posh. Yeah. And actually we're rough as spanners. Rough, that... a, rough as a badger's arse is what my stepdad used to say. Rough Ooh. as a badger's arse. Yeah. That's what my family used to say. I just chose spanners instead. <laughs> you can I take the girl of... out of the council state, but you can't take the council state out of the girls. Whereas well, so. I have censored myself. Yeah. <laughs> we'll talk about this some more. Okay. We'll talk about this more in that video. But um, until then, it's goodbye from me. And goodbye from me. Bye.